Ulysses, Part 3 Nostos, Episode 15 Circe. The time, midnight. The scene, brothel. Bella Cohen's brothel, to be precise, the one on Tyrone Street, in an area of Dublin known as Monto, which was noted for prostitution and had songs written about that. The colour is violet, the technique is hallucination, correspondences include Bella as Circe, or the beasts, Telemachus, Ulysses, and Hermes. The science or art is magic, and the meaning being the man-eating orc. The organ is locomotor apparatus, you can probably figure out what that is, and symbols include zoology, personification, pantheism, poison, and antidote. As for other characters, I'm pretty sure anybody of any significance in the novel shows up here, including a few people who aren't in the novel elsewhere, and also people who are clearly of no significance. That'll be Bloom. Plot. The Mabbot Street entrance of Night Town, before which stretches an uncobbled tram siding set with skeleton tracks, red and green will-o'-the-wisps, and danger signals. Rows of grimy houses with gaping doors. Rare lamps with faint rainbow fins. Round Rabbi Otis, a halted ice gondola, stunted men and women squabble. They grab wafers between which are wedged lumps of coral and copper snow. Sucking, they scatter slowly. Children. The swankum of the gondola, high reared, forges on through the murk, white and blue under a lighthouse. Whistles call and answer. A drunken Lynch and Daedalus the Younger have arrived at their destination, the Night Town. Bloom, though sober, missed his stop and is racing to try and catch up with them, anxious to keep an eye on Stephen. Between Stephen being drunk and Bloom being rattled with doubt, regret and guilt, hallucinations of all kinds of wild and wonderful and improbable and awful things happen. Characters show up who have no right uh, nor place to be there, and it's hard to tell what is real from what imagined. Some of the highlights may include Bloom's arrest and trial, where the charges shift from witness to witness, the apparition of Stephen's mother, Bloom's interviews with his father and grandfather, a fight Stephen gets into with some members of the British Army, and the arrival of Bella Cohen. So much happens without necessarily having any scene breaks, and I say scene breaks, as the whole chapter is written in the style of a theatrical script, with copious stage directions. Bloom. Wild goose chase this. Disorderly houses, Lord knows where they are gone. Drunks cover distance double quick. Nice mix-up. Scene at Westland Row, then jump in first class with a third ticket. Then too far. Train with engine behind. Might have taken me to Malahide or a siding for the night, or collision. Second drink does it. Once is a dose. What am I following him for? Still, he's the best of that lot. If I hadn't heard about Mrs. Beaufoy pure fight, I wouldn't have gone and I wouldn't have met K Kiss Met. He'll lose that cash. Relieving office here. The door opens. Bella Cohen, a massive whore mistress, enters. She is dressed in a three-quarter ivory gown, fringed around the hem and with tasseled selvage, and cools herself, flirting a black horn fan like Minnie Hawk in Carmen. On her left hand are wedded and keeper rings. Her eyes are deeply carboned. She has a sprouting moustache. Her olive face is heavy, slightly sweated, and full-nosed with orange-tainted nostrils. She has large, pendant, burl eardrops. So much happens here that there's barely time to draw breath. We are thrown from one action to another at angles of 90 degrees before occasionally, and without warning, spending, an extended, uh, spending extended periods exploring one or other theme. Surprisingly, this is a chapter I find to be a quick enough read, even though it's the longest one in the book, uh, by a considerable length, hitting nearly 5,000 lines and 37,000 words. Ithaca, the second longest in terms of lines, is about half the length. 
It takes us on another odyssey into a land of make-believe, as the greatest fears of Bloom and Daedalus are visited upon them, and they are transported to the upside down Dublin of their fears. In so many ways, this is one of the incredible things of this chapter. How funny everything is for us, while for the two, it is a land of fear and confusion. This is also where we begin to learn the purpose of the potato. You may recall reading in chapter 4 that Bloom says as he leaves the house, Potato I have. It shows up a couple of times more uh, without Great Herald before it becomes a motif here. Bloom keeps it in his pocket where a young prostitute finds it when um, looking for something else he, you might find through a pocket. He refers to it as a talisman heirloom and at another point a remembrance of his mother. There appears to have been some belief that, uh, at the time that keeping a potato on hand would help to avoid or ease rheumatism, and Bloom does call it poor mama's panacea. This chapter is just the latest of Joyce's little tricks to pull us back further into the book. As I alluded to on in Wandering Arcs, there are elements uh, here that we find out later and then have to clarify, and it helps greatly our understanding almost as though it would have been better to read the book from the ending first before the start. But reading and rereading the book is something that rewards uh, the reader. And his uh, change of pace to keep the thing flowing quickly, but hitting different character after different character and point after point is a really remarkable way to keep us there and keep us interested and excited when after several hundred thousand words we might be getting a little bit bored and long, still to watch that twilight comes love's old song.